This is the final chapter in the Baja 50 uh, dirt bike renovation. So today we're going to look at tuning. We're going to tune the carb, the clutch, and set the brakes up. But first, I'm going to bring this up to my daughter's house today. It's a beautiful day, but it's cold out, so I've got my coffee. Okay, let's get going. Well, the day is here where we are going to start tuning our little Baja 50. And I'm going to start with the carburetor. But before I can even do that, I need to get the bike running and I need to get it up to operating temperature. So we're going to do that. Failure to bring the bike up to operating temperature results in a really poor tune of the carburetor that never really performs well when you're out on the trail. Once we're done that, I'm going to shift my attention to the clutch pack. We're going to adjust it so that the auto shifting clutch is set properly so the transmission works well. And lastly, but certainly not least, we're going to set up the brakes so the bike can stop. This is really the number one system that you should be looking at on these small bikes or any motorcycle. It's great if you can get it moving, but if you can't stop it, as I said before, you're in a world of hurts. All right. Let's get started and see if we can get that carburetor running well. The carburetors on these little bikes couldn't be simpler. Now once you have your throttle cable free play set, there's only two screws that you really need to worry about on the outside of the carburetor. Now the first one is your idle speed screw. Turning this screw in will raise the idle and backing it out will lower the idle. Now you want the idle to be smooth and, and very low, so you try to lower that as far as you can without the engine getting lumpy or stalling. Now once you have that baseline set, we'll turn our attention to the pilot air screw or the air fuel mixture screw. Now this controls basically your throttle response between idle and about an eighth of a turn of the throttle. And these particular carbs are notorious for having a stumble right off of idle, especially if you give it too much throttle all at once. The carburetor just is not sophisticated enough to catch up with uh, that much air being introduced into the system. So I took about an hour and tweaked this back and forth until I could get it where the stumble was um, manageable. It wasn't too bad. And let's face it, most of the time you're not whacking the throttle wide open, especially on a little bike like this, which most people are just learning how to ride. Okay, let's have a little bit closer look at this thing. As I said earlier, we're going to start by making sure there's a little bit of free play in the throttle. And you can see I have a little bit here now. It's just a little bit of a wiggle. You want to make sure that the carburetor is fully sitting on the idle screw. 
So to do this, we come up to this furl on the top. We undo the jam nut, and then we turn in or turn out this rubber furl. This effectively lengthens or shortens the throttle cable and allows it to have that free play in the twist throttle itself. Once you're ready, you just lock it down and it's ready to go. I'm just gonna roll this thing outside now because we do have to heat up the engine. So I'm gonna start it. That basically is pretty simple. We turn the ignition on. I'm gonna turn the throttle, or sorry, the fuel petcock to the reserve position because I don't have a lot of fuel in the bike. Give it a little bit of choke. And honestly, one kick, this thing starts right up. It really does run very, very well. Once it's running, you can kind of see here, it does have that little bit of stumble I talked about. So I'm just going to let it sit out here and burble away for 5 or 10 minutes until the engine itself comes up to speed. You can also take it for a little ride if you want to heat it up. Now I'm going to start by turning in the air fuel mixture screw until it gently seats against the bottom of the carburetor. Now I don't have a manual for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back this out to full turns. That's usually a good baseline to start from. Now I'll start the bike up and then I'll turn my attention to the idle adjustment. I'm going to turn the idle screw until the bike idles smoothly at the lowest RPM that I can get it. So sometimes it'll stumble a little bit so you have to play with it. It's pretty finicky on this bike. A little you know, eighth of a turn makes a lot of difference. But once I get that adjusted, now I'm going to come in and I'm going to start by turning the screw out a full turn. Now what I'm looking for is for the engine RPMs to actually increase. I want to see if the bike is running rich or it's running lean. So I'll turn it a full turn out and then I'll back it to the baseline and in a full turn as well. Now once I figure out where the highest RPM is, I'm going to start sort of blipping the throttle, trying to see how effective I am at eliminating that stumble. And then I'll start by maybe turning it out a half a turn, checking the stumble again, and then maybe turning it in a quarter turn, trying to eliminate as much of that stumble as I possibly can. Now, it takes a while to do this, and you're going to come back and forth multiple times. You may need to take the bike for a ride to actually get it to sort of effectively work. But eventually you'll get it. You'll get it so it's the best it can be. Once that's done, I'm going to come back in and I'm just going to readjust the throttle again to get the idle as low as possible while it's still smooth. So I hope that helps to explain how to adjust this carburetor. In the end, I was able to get it tuned reasonably well where it would take throttle and accelerate smoothly. I just can't stress enough how important it is to warm these engines up before you start to adjust the carburetor though. In the temperatures that I was adjusting it, um, it was actually pretty cold. It took about 10 minutes for the engine to come up to operating temperature and to a point where I could confidently adjust that carburetor and hold the settings well. All right, I think that about wraps up this section. Why don't we take a look at the clutch? The clutch in this little motorcycle really is an interesting piece of technology. And we took a little bit deeper dive in past videos. But today I really wanna talk about how to adjust it so that it can shift gears smoothly and, and actually doesn't slip under load. Now, if you've adjusted your idle speed correctly, so you wanna, again, lower it as low as you can get it so the bike still runs smoothly, it will not move when it's in gear. It has a centrifugal action to it that until there's enough engine RPM, the clutch really is ineffective. However, once underway, it uses a different system to disengage the clutch between gear shifts. Now normally you would do this with a hand lever. You would pull the lever in, it puts pressure on the pressure plate, releases the clutch pack and allows you to shift gears without grinding or, or jerking the bike. But these little 50cc motors and these little clutches really fool you by performing that action down at the toe shifter. When you pull up or push down on that shifter lever, 
it actually activates a, a ramp system that pushes the pressure plate in and disengages the clutch pack. Now, like any clutch, this does wear over time and requires a little bit of adjustment. So why don't we look now at how to do that? It's really simple. Our goal here really is to introduce a little bit of clearance between two components that sit underneath this cover. There is a set of roller bearings that actually push in and out from the cover and push against this ramped adjustable plate here which actually actuates the clutch itself. So to do this we break open this jam nut and back it off and then we thread in the small adjustment bolt turning it clockwise. Now what this does is it pulls those roller bearings away from that plate. Then we turn it counterclockwise until we just feel those roller bearings touch that adjustable ramped plate. Now we need to introduce that gap between the two pieces. And the way we do this is we identify where the bolt sits now and we want to turn that bolt about an eighth of a turn or 45 degrees clockwise. This actually pulls those three roller bearings away from that ramped plate and creates the gap required to meet our spec. So here I'll just use a protractor to give you an example of what that 45 degrees or eighth of a uh, turn looks like. So I'm just going to use a flat bladed screwdriver now and turn the adjustment bolt clockwise one eighth of a turn. There we go. Now I'm going to gently tighten in by hand that jam nut and I'm going to hold the, the bolt to make sure it doesn't move. And once it's up against the shoulder I'll just use a wrench to snug it down tight. And there you have it. Your clutch is adjusted. It really is that easy to adjust the clutch on these little motorcycles. Now these clutches come in bikes all the way up to about 110 cc's, but the principles very, very similar for each one of them. So why don't we now take a look at the brakes and see if we can get those adjusted properly and safe for the next rider. Okay, let's do that now. The brakes on these little bikes actually give you a little bit of a wear indicator right here. So when you step on the pedal here, you will see that that indicator only moves about an eighth of an inch. There's lots of brake pads left or brake uh, shoes left on these drum brakes. The front's the same way. So what I really want to do is focus on making sure that I have enough free play in the lever like this. Very similar to the throttle, we need to have a little bit of free play in there so the cables don't lock up when you turn the handlebars but also that the brakes don't bottom out when you give a good squeeze on them. You want to have a little bit of space. So on the front brakes, there's really a, a macro adjustment right down by the fork axle itself. So you can make major adjustments down here if you need to. Um, and then you just lock the small jam nut down. And then you can adjust the free play up at the handlebars using this uh, ferrule at the top. So very similar to the throttle, you unlock the jam nut and you turn that ferrule in and out until you get, you know, enough that you can slip a couple credit cards in between the handle and the lever to make sure you have some free play up there. Now the rear brake, you just want to make sure you don't have to press it down too far or that the brake isn't dragging. And it's even easier. It has one cam actuated nut on the back that you simply turn until you reach the desired effect. Well, I'm glad to get those brakes set up properly. I've said this before, but I think it's worth reiterating. Brakes really are the most important safety feature and the most important system on any piece of power sports equipment. And it becomes even more important when you're not the one riding it. A bike this size is probably going to somebody small who's learning how to ride, so you want to make sure that the bike functions properly and is safe and stops well. I was really fortunate at the end of filming this that my old time friend Harold came up from Woodstock working on some business locally. Now he called me up to let me know he was in town and I had him come on over and we shared a few laughs in the tinker shed. Now when he saw this bike, I asked him if he wouldn't mind taking it for a ride for me. Harold's a little bit smaller than I am and fits the bike a little bit better than I do. 
So he agreed to take it up and down the street and run it through the gears for me. Now, he doesn't have a helmet on here. He was completely unprepared, and he wasn't going to use my helmet, obviously, because of all the circumstances going on. We don't want to share any close proximity like that. But he did have a good chance to take it out for a shakedown and thought it ran great. This really was probably the most fun project that I have done in a number of years. And I think you could see that on my friend Harold's face as he ripped up and down the street on it, reliving his youth. And I hope this series as a whole has encouraged you to go and look for something like this, a little project that you can build some skills with and ultimately give your kids maybe the best Christmas gift or present that they've ever had. So until next time, I'm Dino for Dino's Tinker Shed. You have yourself a great day, and I'll see you soon. Bye now. This thing really is pretty fun.